tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. They call it the chair of death. More than 300 years ago, a condemned killer pronounced a curse on the seat as he was led to the gallows. Legend has it that ever since, those who ignored the warnings were doomed to an untimely death. For 11 years, Audrey Santo has been in a coma-like state, yet her bedroom has become a religious shrine. A constant stream of visitors believes that somehow in this mysterious sleep state, Audrey can perform miracles. A dog rescues a total stranger from drowning. A pet pig saves the life of its owner. What turns animals into heroes? Is it instinct, a sixth sense, or something more? It may look like nothing more than a worn and weather-beaten scrap of olive wood. Many believe it holds extraordinary power, the power to heal. Is it possible that this is an actual remnant of the legendary Holy Grail? Can the power of love transcend death? Consider the purity and simplicity of a single red rose. This woman says it was a gift sent from beyond the grave by her father, television star Michael Landon. Join me for these fascinating stories. Perhaps someone somewhere has that one vital clue that can solve a mystery. Perhaps that someone is watching. Perhaps it's you. village of Thirsk has all the quirky charms and quaint customs a visitor might expect. It also has one attraction you might not expect. As you wander through the clutter of the village's tiny museum, you might find yourself drawn to a remote alcove and a valuable antique chair. But it's not on display for its rarity. According to the locals, this chair is cursed with an astonishing and lethal power. It all started way back in 1669. Thomas Busby, a convicted murderer on his way to the gallows, was granted a last wish, a final pint of ale on his favorite chair at his favorite pub. When he finished, the condemned man gathered himself for the hangman, pointed to the chair and let his voice ring out. May sudden death come to anyone who dares sit in my chair. Thomas Busby's curse echoed down the centuries, proving its potency over and over again. At least that's how it's told here with typical British reserve. After he was hanged, this chair remained in the pub and uh, people were dared to sit in it. But gradually it became noticed that they were coming to a sticky end afterwards or very shortly afterwards. No one knows exactly how many victims a curse has claimed since Thomas Busby met his maker. But the legend gained a great deal of notoriety during World War II. Airmen at a nearby base made the pub a hot spot and the chair a hot seat. People started noticing. Those who sat didn't come back. Well, until I came here, I didn't believe in curses. But now I have mixed feelings after hearing certain things about this chair. The only way I would sit in the chair if my doctor told me I've only got 12 hours to live. A great many people take it very seriously. I'm not a superstitious man, but I wouldn't sit in it. Maybe a little ride, Busby chair. What do you think? The chair? 1967, 300 years after Busby drank his last pint, a pair of Royal Air Force pilots downed a few too many of their own. How's that feel, sir? Not bad at all. It's still hot. It's still ticking a bit. I you think. feel all right? I feel pretty damn good, I tell you. How about uh, a go for it? A go? A little spin. How about it? Oh, go on. for a go. I'm not afraid. <laughs> not Sit afraid right down in here. Oh, 
it's not bad at all. It's not bad at all. It's a bit tingly. It is tingly. It's good, though. The tingle didn't last long. The pilots were about to be grounded for good. The chair was no longer known merely as Busby's chair. Now it was the chair of death. A few years later, two bricklayers working nearby took a lunch break at the pub. Are you feeling lucky today? Despite the chair's sinister reputation, they couldn't resist daring its power. You've got to be kidding. There have been a lot of people who tell you it's true. I'll have to give it a try. Oh, you think I'm scared then? Mm. Don't know if you are or you aren't. Curious to know, that. You do it. <laughs> Not me, eh, fellas? Go on. All right then. Yes, yeah, right then. Huh? All right. That afternoon, well Busby's man. curse struck again. Oh! Uh, go. Here we go. You guys ready? Legend has it the chair never had an off day. Anyone who warmed his wooden bottom died swiftly. A roofer who tempted the chair fell to his death when the roof he was working on collapsed. A cleaning woman stumbled into the chair while mopping. Soon after, a brain tumor killed her. No one escaped the chair of death. Ah, well, with all this rain we've been having, I haven't been in much need of new supplies. For safety's sake, the pub owner finally moved the chair into the basement, out of harm's way, or so he thought. You actually believe in the curse, then? Well, don't sit in it. I can tell you more than one or two stories about people who've met a premature death. If you believe in that sort of thing. Within the hour, the delivery man's delivery days were over. It was the last straw. There was only one safe place for the chair, the local museum. The curators made sure no one would sit in Busby's chair again. They hung it on the wall, five feet off the ground. People come in, uh, they're, they're horrified. Ooh, they, they sort of uh, register horror when they come in and see this chair and, and hear the story. Though its killing days are presumed to be over, people continue to come forward with more tales of the chair of death. The strangest one, it was just a couple of months ago, a fellow rang me, a retired man from Derby, who'd been stationed on the Air Force Base during the war. And he was a member of the RAF band. And they used to play functions in Thursk and travel there by truck. On the way back one night, they picked up two airmen who were walking home from a night out in the town. And one of these airmen wanted to use a toilet, so they stopped here at the Busby Stoop. While waiting for the airman, the driver of the truck, all unknowing, sat in Busby's chair. When the airman didn't return, the driver left the pub without him. The abandoned and furious airman had to make his own way back to the base. When he got there, he got a building brick and smashed the head of this driver and killed him. These days, a chair isn't taken down even for cleaning, just in case anyone is foolhardy enough to test Busby's curse once more. The power of the chair has been hung up with it, and uh, I wouldn't advise anybody to take it down and sit on it now, because it does seem that those who challenge the power of the chair I've been the quickest to succumb to it. Next, the unique and strange story of a girl who many believe is somehow healing the sick, even though she has been in a near coma for 11 years. See, this is Audrey's room, and the person sitting down on her left is her grandmother, and the person standing on your right is one of the nurses. Meet Audrey Santo. This is not a reenactment. Audrey has been in a coma-like state called akinetic mutism for 11 years. Every week, people line up at this window to get a glimpse of her, not because they are morbid, 
but because they believe she's a miracle maker. Her astonishing story begins when Audrey played by her family's swimming pool in Worcester, Massachusetts. She was only three years old when tragedy struck. Audrey was underwater for several minutes before she was rescued by her brother. On the way to the emergency room, she went into cardiac arrest. It was a parent's worst nightmare. Audrey's initial diagnosis after the near drowning was uh, that she had massive brain damage from the drowning and uh, very poor prognosis. They didn't think she was going to live very long. We just started praying. That's all. Just prayed. Because when things are totally out of your control, what else can you do? It's God's control. Then you got to give him the ball and let him run with it. Audrey lived, but she has remained bedridden for 11 years. She shows an awareness of what's going on around her, but she is unable to move or talk. She's not fully conscious by any stretch of the imagination, and yet she's not unconscious. A year after Audrey's accident, her mother took her to the famous miracle site of Medjugorje, hoping for a cure. The trip nearly killed Audrey. But from that time on, a gradual progression of unexplained phenomena took place. One of the most remarkable occurred in the Santos living room. October 1993, Audrey was nine. A picture of the Virgin Mary appeared to be crying, not tears, but drops of oil. We're all looking at this image. And, and I said, please, you know, if this is for Audrey, let us know this because all of a sudden it occurred just to the to the kids and I that maybe this weeping was for Audrey's healing. There are many me meanings of oil, for example, healing and so on. And all, uh, I conclude quickly then that God is saying, this is a holy place and this little girl is mine. It started with one weeping picture. Then, as the days went on, almost every religious icon in Audrey's room began to cry tears of oil. Another image started weeping, and then another image started weeping. We started thinking, well, is there a rhyme or reason to this? Or could it be a hoax? One person who thought it was a sham was a newly hired nurse. I'm enough. When I started piecing everything together, I, at first I'm saying, I gotta get out of here. These guys are nuts. I really tried to call their bluff on this. But as I stayed there, I just, I believed it. I, I couldn't, I can't find any reason why these things are happening, and I have checked. I checked the, the statues, I checked the cups. I mean, I'm looking for wires and anything that would set off an oil reaction. And there was, there was absolutely nothing, nothing there that I can explain why it's happening. News began to spread within the Catholic community. Fervent believers began to request samples of the oil. Some even anointed their sick loved ones with it. The mysterious events began to take on a new dimension. Caitlin McQuaid was thought to have cerebral palsy. She no longer has braces on her legs. Victor Fanucci recovered from crippling neck pain. A motorcycle accident had left Joey Paralisi with severely injured legs. He can now walk without crutches. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave us the Eucharist as the memorial of your suffering and death. In a remarkable departure from tradition, the local Catholic diocese approved the weekly performance of Mass in a makeshift sanctuary in the family's backyard. Pilgrims came to the Santo home to ask Audrey to pray for them and to receive samples of the oil. At first they came by the dozens, then by the hundreds, until the numbers reached the thousands. Joanne and Stanley Pirog were given a sample of oil by a friend when their 17-year-old son, Jim, lapsed into a coma after a car crash. A serious student, he intended to go to college. That was before a pickup hit the driver's side of his car. They told us that uh, Jim's uh, condition was very, very grave, and it would be a miracle if he uh, survived the night. We're concerned that Jim was not going to make it. 
Jim was still comatose seven days later when they placed the oil on his forehead. And then, The monitor showed that Jim was responding. I can still remember the uh, feeling of awe because I, I didn't expect that particular effect. And it was just a few hours later that he did come out of his coma. And the nurses used to call him Miracle Kid. It took Jim a year to improve enough from his injuries to return to high school and graduate. Audrey's astonishing abilities took a new twist in June of 1994. Without warning, a mysterious rash appeared on her legs. Was Audrey taking on the painful side effects of sick people? Dr. Harding had no explanation for it, so a laboratory examined the biopsy of Audrey's skin. And they sent back a report that said it's uh the rash uh, that you might see with a patient on chemotherapy. And she wasn't on chemotherapy. Knowing the supernatural stuff going around her, perhaps somebody had come in, maybe their wife dying of cancer, or their husband or their child, and on chemotherapy, and had asked her if she would ask God for healing for their loved one. And that, uh, you know, perhaps she took that on, that uh, suffering and uh, on behalf of a patient. But one of the most incredible aspects of Audrey's story is Audrey herself. After 11 years of being bedridden, she is surprisingly healthy. You just wouldn't expect her to be so well-nourished looking, her skin to be in such perfect condition. She really just looks like this maybe happened a, a few weeks ago or a month ago, not like it happened 11 years ago. The girl's never had a bed sore. You know, and for someone who doesn't move around and have a trach and stuff, she really has not had any kind of pneumonia or cold or anything in three years, which is really in itself <laughs> a remarkable thing. It's got to be God. I mean, it, it, it's supernatural comes from two sources in my book, the uh, devil or God. And uh, since this is all good and people are coming back to God and they're being healed, and, uh, this must be of God. Next, heartwarming stories about a blind dog and an overweight pig. Can you guess what qualities make them an unsolved mystery? They say that inside even the smallest dog lives the heart and mind of a wolf. So what strange force makes these animals our best friends? Even more puzzling, what inexplicable instinct persuades them to risk their lives for ours? What is the potent and mysterious bond between us and them? Go get it, go get it. Annette McDonald and her dog Norman often walk along the shore of a tidal estuary in Seaside, Oregon. Norman is a yellow lab, the kind of dog often used to guide the blind. In this case, however, the roles are reversed. Norman is blind. Annette guides him. When Norman's going to bump into something, I just say, easy, easy. If I throw the stick and he doesn't hear where it lands and um, he goes the wrong direction, I tell him to go the other way. I just say, other way, other way, and he'll usually turn around and go the right way. On August 5th, 1997, Annette was guiding Norman through the usual game when Norman suddenly reacted to a different sound. <gasps> Norman! Norman! He just took off like a bullet. I was surprised that he could even run that fast. Annette tried to call him back, worried he would hurt himself but he ignored her completely. Help! 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 Fifteen-year-old Lisa Nibley was caught in the dangerous undertow of the incoming tide. I was having a hard time getting enough air in, you know. 
my lungs were just burning because it was just so hard for me to breathe and my face was just on fire because I was screaming so loud for someone to help me. Amazingly, Norman started swimming straight toward her. I couldn't believe that he knew what to do, that he knew somebody needed him and he went and did it. It was just, it was incredible. When Lisa saw Norman heading toward her, she stopped screaming. Norman became instantly disoriented. And it suddenly realized Norman had been following Lisa's voice. Call him! Call him! His name is Norman! His name is Norman! Call him! He'll come to you! Norman! Norman! The moment Lisa called him, Norman got his bearings and swam straight toward her. Come on, Norman! It was the most helpless moment in my life. I felt like everything was depending on Norman to get out there and get her because there was no way I could. I'm not a swimmer and I wouldn't have been able to save her. It was all depending on him. When he swam out to me, he kind of looked at me and my face and kind of like he was saying, grab a hold of me, I'm gonna help you. Lisa grabbed Norman, then lost her grip. Her arms were shaking with fatigue. Incredibly, Norman came back for another try. He turned around and like swung himself around so I could grab the back of him so he could swim and I could hold on to him. I think he, he knew that he had to help me. He, he knew what he was doing. To Lisa's astonishment, Norman towed her toward shore as though he'd been trained for it all his life. Moments later, they were back in the shallows, safe. He's my guardian angel and I, mean, I just you know, I was so happy that that happened, that he saved me, and it was amazing. Neither Annette nor Lisa understand what mysterious instinct inspired a blind dog to risk his life for a stranger. But Lisa will be forever grateful to her hero, Norman. When you look into a dog's soft brown eyes, it's not hard to see the heart of a hero. But what about other animals? August 4th, 1998. Joe Altsman was vacationing at a campground on Lake Erie. While her husband was out fishing, she was relaxing in their trailer. Suddenly, she felt a pain in her chest and her left arm went numb. Help! Help! Help me! No one in the campground heard her cries. No one except Lulu, Help. her pet pot-bellied pig. Joe's heart attack continued, her pain increasing. Is there? She became terrified that she would die, no one close enough to help. Seconds passed, minutes. She was getting weaker. Hello? Is anybody home? Help me! I'm having a heart attack. Call 911. The phone is in the center. All right, I'll, I'll get some help. I'll get an ambulance. Just hold on. I'll be right back. Within minutes, paramedics were rushing Joe to the hospital. They took me to the emergency room and admitted me. And they said in even 15 minutes, I would have no quality of life or I would have died. But how did the young man happen to arrive just in the nick of time? What guardian angel guided him to her door? To Joe's amazement, it turned out to be Lulu the pig. From the moment Joe fell to the floor, Lulu seemed to know something was very wrong. She ran to the kitchen and squeezed herself through the dog door, scraping her belly raw. Outside, Lulu threw herself against the gate, battering it until it broke. Her cries kept getting fainter. That's because she was going farther away from me. But I didn't register that at the time. Lulu went to the campground's main crossroads. Incredibly, she parked herself in the middle of the road, forcing drivers to back up or swerve around her. Even more amazing, Lulu repeatedly retraced her steps, returning constantly to Joe. 
she'd come back in through all the doggy door and scrape her belly and check on me and put that big mug of hers over my face. And she'd go out back out through everything and do everything again. It just seemed like I'd hollered forever and Lulu had run back and forth forever and nobody came. But Lulu apparently wasn't willing to give up. Finally, someone stopped. Lulu's behavior defies explanation. Did she actually conceive and execute a plan to save Joe's life? How could a pig do that? And why would she? Animal behaviorists might credit pack instinct or genetically programmed responses to fear pheromones. But Joe has a simpler answer. Lulu loved her. Every morning I thank God that she was there. And every morning I thank her. Lulu literally saved my life. Next, some say that water from a chalice called the Mantius Cup has the power to heal. Could it be the Holy Grail? It was a most sacred object of the Middle Ages, a great elusive prize coveted by King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Centuries ago, wandering minstrels popularized the image of a bejeweled golden chalice, the Holy Grail. But that is a romantic ideal. The reality may be quite different. Thousands of people believe this well-worn palm-sized bit of olive wood kept under lock and key in West Wales is the true grail. All that is left of a simple workman's cup, the cup from which Jesus Christ himself drank at the Last Supper. The cup is a unique symbol which brings God and man together. And of course, to, for the Catholic at least, um, Christ is present in the cup. Um, many people regard the Holy Grail and Jesus Christ as one and the same. It is a powerful notion that the lips of Christ actually touched an object that still exists today. But is it truly the grail? Where is the proof? Believers say it lies in the cup's miraculous power to heal. Hundreds testify they have been cured of the worst afflictions, arthritis, heart disease, blindness, leprosy, even deadly cancers. The legend of the grail begins with this wondrous journey from biblical Palestine to a modest cottage in England. For more than 2,000 years, every object associated with the Last Supper and the crucifixion has taken on a mystical significance, none more so than the Holy Grail. For the historian, the Grail is legend, pure and simple, but legend is an amazing thing. It can enable people to do heroic things under the worst of circumstances. And that's why the Grail story is one of the greatest stories in the entire history of the world, and always will be. Though it was not recorded in the Bible, the Grail legend holds that blood spilled from Christ's wounds as his body was being prepared for burial. Joseph of Arimathea caught a few drops in the Grail. After the resurrection, Joseph was accused of stealing the body of Christ and was imprisoned without food or water. Each day, however, an angel placed a wafer in the Grail, keeping Joseph alive until he managed to escape with his life and the Grail. He brought the precious cup to the Western Isles of Britain. There he founded the Church of the Holy Grail on Glastonbury Tor, a church whose ruins still stand today, 100 miles west of London. There is sufficient evidence, written evidence, to support the coming of Joseph and the Holy Grail with 11 or so disciples to the western confines of England, indeed to Glastonbury, via the Bristol Channel, from Palestine. For a thousand years after Joseph came to Glastonbury, the Grail remained hidden away, all but forgotten. Then in the 12th century, poets and troubadours revived the legend. The quest for the Grail captivated all of Europe. 
It's the spiritual equivalent to, say, the Star Wars trilogy, the Superman movies, the Batman movies, all rolled into one. Everybody knows the characters, everybody has some sense of what's at stake. It's the salvation of the human race. Three centuries after the revival of the Grail legend, Henry VIII added another chapter. He ordered his soldiers to loot the monasteries and destroy the churches, including Glastonbury. Henry VIII's Reformation was one of the great acts of vandalism in the history of the world. Uh, to put it bluntly, the king wanted to get rich so he could fight France and Spain, and he also wanted to remove what he thought were the wrong bits of religion from his land. And that's why these great medieval abbeys had to go. A group of monks fled Glastonbury just ahead of the king's soldiers. Legend has it that they carried with them a secret treasure, the True Grail. For a time, they hid in a monastery in Wales called Strata, Florida. When Strata, Florida suffered the same fate as Glastonbury, the monks fled again. This time to Nantia's house, a mansion owned by a family of aristocrats named Powell. There, the monks found sanctuary. There were seven of them, six monks and a prior, and they uh, remained in Nantios house until one by one they passed on. Uh, the last of the seven to die was the prior, and it was the prior who handed this sacred relic over to the Powell family. The Powells guarded the monk's relic for 400 years, handing it down from one generation to the next. It became known as the Nantius Cup, what began to transpire was that the chalice had healing properties. How they discovered this is not known, but at some point in time, the healing properties became more apparent. For many years, Reverend Griffiths knew only the barest facts about the Nantius Cup. Then one night in 1988, he had his first encounter with the mysterious powers of the Grail. I was on itinerant ministry during those days, and this particular day, I was traveling to North Wales early in the morning. So I'd set a time of rising at 6 a.m. But at 4 a.m., I was awakened by a voice. The first time, it didn't register. And I heard a second time the voice say, you will find the holy chalice. Before dawn that very morning, a friend called. The friend suggested that the Reverend include the Nantius Cup in a coming exhibition of Christian artifacts. He told Griffiths he might learn more about the cup at the ruined abbey of Strata, Florida. When I gave the curator the details, I was amazed to find that he was convinced of my experience, and he was more than willing to help, but he made it to understand that he was breaking a rule because he had promised the family that he would never redirect anyone to their present location. Now, the reason for this was because the present cup owner's mother was sometimes inundated with as many as a 1,000 visitors per week. And as a result, she experienced a breakdown. The current owner of the cup, another direct descendant of the Powell family, lives in seclusion protecting her privacy as vigilantly as she guards the Nantius Cup. As the guardian of the Holy Grail, my duty to safeguard the cup at all times, but to allow people to drink from it, to have water from it, and uh, to send water to people if they're ill. When I first set eyes on the chalice, I was a little disappointed because it was only fragmentary. Perhaps there's only a third of the original vessel left. But when I handled it, I had a total, totally different appreciation of it. Uh, I can't describe uh, in, in human language the effect it had upon me, as if I was already in paradise. It is precisely that feeling of holiness that has led many to believe the cup has the power to heal. The cup's guardian gives water that has been poured over the cup to Reverend Griffiths. He pats the holy water on small prayer mats and sends them to those who are sick and crippled. The Reverend says some of the results have been nothing short of miraculous. I have a regular meal 
with a young man who was once totally blind and today he has perfect sight. I cite one case of a, a young man who was a leper, had a leprous condition for 11 years, but the following day his skin was perfectly clean from every trace of leprosy. Uh, we have many cases of arthritics and rheumatics who have been healed, if not in the short term, in the long term, for which they were told originally there was no cure. Marlene Checkley testifies to her own miracle. Well, like I would imagine, it was every woman's nightmare. I was having a shower one morning and I found a lump in my left breast. Marlene's doctor believed the lump was cancerous. While waiting for a mammogram, Marlene wore one of the prayer claws beneath her clothes. And then by the time I went for the mammogram, everything was clear. The lump was still there, but there was nothing cancerous. Um, the doctors did say that the lump would still stay there, but after a week or two, the lump went, and I've had no further problems since with that. The results and the testimonies were so amazing that I knew then that behind my whole experience, from the time when I heard the voice to this present time, that I have no doubts whatsoever about the authenticity of the chalice being the Holy Grail that Jesus used at the Last Supper. Is the Nantius cup the Holy Grail? We may never know. The cup has not been carbon dated or scientifically tested in any way. Its guardian fear such testing might damage it. As it turns out, there are at least half a dozen chalices scattered across Europe that many claim are equally strong contenders of the title of the True Grail. It is interesting to note, however, that the others are made of more expensive materials, gold, bronze, and other metals. The Nantius cup is simple wood, precisely the kind of cup a humble carpenter would drink from. Next, did television star Michael Landon send a gift to his daughter from beyond the grave? A compelling testament to the power of love, the real highway to heaven. What do a Christmas ornament, $300 in cash, and a fragile red rose have in common? Some would say they were all signs from heaven, tangible gifts sent from beyond the grave by television star Michael Landon, grandfather Herman Stegos, and college student Joe McCarthy. 18-year-old Joe McCarthy of Wausau, Wisconsin, was a go-getter in every sense, a top 10 student in his high school class. When it came time for college, he chose Notre Dame. In June of 1987, Joe had just returned home after his freshman year when he was killed in a car accident. When Joe died, there's, number one, there's emptiness in your heart and in your mind. It's like, where is he? Is he okay? I kept thinking at the time, if he could only just talk to me, just one time. And... Everyone's grieving around you, and so you're thinking, I wish I knew. It's just that thought, is he okay? The McCarthys didn't actually expect an answer. Then three days after the funeral. I was uh, going through the, through the basement out into the, into the garage and um, I saw a, the angel that tops our Christmas tree laying there. Since Joe died in June and we had the Christmas ornaments stored in an upstairs closet, I thought it was kind of strange, but I didn't really think a whole lot of it. Joe used to kid me about vacuuming. It was like, Mom, if you ever get to heaven, there's going to be a vacuum up there because you do it so much. I said, well, cleanliness is next to godliness, right, kid? So I did. I vacuumed every day. I still do. And I saw something on the rug, and I picked it up, and I just thought, it's an ornament. And I just looked at it, and I thought, this is one of the ornaments from the Christmas tree. Why is it here? And I just set it aside. I set it on a shelf we had there. And I didn't think much of it at the time. That evening, Dennis told Kathleen about the angel he had discovered. It was right there in the middle of the floor. I almost stepped on it. You know, I found an angel today, too. 
And I went and got it and showed it to him. And it said, it said Joseph on it. He said, it's a sign, he's okay. The McCarthys had four angel ornaments, each engraved with one of their children's names. This one remarkably had been Joe's. I looked at it and, and saw Joe's name on there. It was, it was really an incredible feeling. The fact that he, that he gave his, his mother an angel and I an angel on, on the same day, to me, was, was pretty powerful. It may seem amazing, but the McCarthy's experience is hardly uncommon. Dr. Louis Legrand chronicles more than 50 similar experiences in his book, After Death Communication. This happens just an innumerable amount of times. And that's why we need to validate these situations. That's why we need to get the general public to be more accepting and open to this. We can't explain it. Science will never be able to explain it. Uh, it's a gift to the heart, and that's what explains it. Indeed, heaven-sent signs seem to come from those with big hearts. People like Herman Stegos, who was 69 when he died unexpectedly, he was very close to his grandchildren, especially his eldest grandson, Anthony. Herman died just three weeks before Christmas. His message arrived with a holiday mail. Kids, present from Aunt Terry. When this package came, it was kind of like, it was exciting for the kids because it took their mind off of, you know, the grieving. They opened up the packages, the wrapping paper was all over, the shipping stuff was all over my mother's living room floor. So I asked Anthony if he could clean it up and take the box out to the garbage. Anthony was on his way out when he suddenly stopped in his tracks. He says his grandfather spoke to him. When I heard his voice, it, it did freak me out because it, it was scary. He said, Mom, Pop just told me I should look under the flap of the box. She just said, quit playing around. She thought I was playing a game. But I wasn't. I said, Anthony, throw the box out. And I thought he was playing with me. He said, no, Mom, you don't understand. I heard him twice. He said, look under the flap, look under the flap. Sure enough, wedged in the bottom flaps of the box was an envelope. Look, it's, it's a card. Inside were three crisp $100 bills, one each for Anthony, his brother, and sister. Beth is convinced the money would have been lost if her father had not spoken from beyond the grave. Yeah. I think that was the biggest message in the whole thing that, you know, Grandpa's still here and Grandpa's still watching you and Grandpa's spending the holidays with you. And I didn't leave and I didn't abandon you. And this is the way that he could tell them, you know, that I'm still here. And this was a sure way of getting out his message that you're not alone, that I'm still here with you and I still love you, each of you. To have had an experience of this nature uh, when love is rekindled, the person is able to reconnect with life again, uh, to get some energy back, to be able to look at themselves in the mirror and say, maybe there is some meaning to what has happened. Meaningful, yes. But were the experiences of Joe's family and Herman's family mere coincidences? Not at all, says Michael Landon's daughter, Cheryl. In 1991, Michael Landon was at the top of his career. He was a highly regarded star of Highway to Heaven, in which he played an angel sent to Earth to help people. Michael first became well known to us as Little Joe on Bonanza. Then he played the lovable father on Little House on the Prairie. Cheryl says that Michael Landon was not very different from the characters he portrayed. There was a warmth about him. There was this love, the spontaneity. It was like he was my my angel from heaven, my father from heaven. When Michael Landon died of cancer in 1991, at a youthful 54, Cheryl was devastated. It was the greatest loss of my life. My best friend, my mentor, my protector, my guidance, everything. My security, it, it was all gone. And I started hearing my dad's voice. My father would come to me in dreams, and I thought, boy, I must be really grieving because I'm hearing my dad's voice. I'm seeing him in my dreams. 
Cheryl vowed to carry on Michael's legacy of emphasizing good deeds and good-heartedness. Her first step was writing a book called I Promised My Dad. As a publishing deadline approached, Cheryl felt more and more uneasy about the prospect of promoting the book on the talk show circuit. I remember going through so much of the emotions and I really thought, how could I go on and do these television shows successfully? And I very clearly heard my father during the day say, when you go to do your first show, I'm gonna leave you a long stem red rose. A year later, Cheryl found herself in Manhattan, nervously preparing for her first talk show appearance. This dress, you think I should wear this instead? That's when she says she heard Michael Landon's voice again. What's wrong? You've been so quiet since we got here. Something really amazing happened to me. What? Just now, when I was standing by the window, I heard his voice again. I mean, he was right there. And this time he told me to find the fountain in Central Park. The strange part is that I knew exactly where this fountain was, never being there before. It was like I was guided exactly to this fountain. When I had gone down to the bottom of the stairwell, there at my feet, exactly where I had stopped, was a long stem red rose. This is just the way my father said it would be. It was like I had discovered a treasure of gold. I was so happy. I was so full of encouragement that it was just like a, a, a boost of, of love, a boost of encouragement. Cheryl's friend, who witnessed the moment, snapped this picture to commemorate it. For Michael Landon's daughter, it is a lasting reminder of his love. A single red rose, two Christmas ornaments, a trio of $100 bills. Are the grief-stricken just too willing to clutch at anything that might bring them comfort? Or is something else at work, something beyond explanation? For the families of Joe McCarthy, Herman Stegos, and Michael Landon, no explanation is needed. They held the proof in their hands. Join me next time for another compelling hour of Unsolved Mysteries.